Hi everyone, thanks for joining in today. I'm excited to have Sarah Bailey joining us. So Sarah is a Melbourne based author and the managing director of advertising agency VMLY and R. Her internationally award-winning Gemma Woodstock trilogy includes The Dark Lake, which was published in 2017, and winner of the Ned Kelly Award for the Best First Fiction and the Davitt Award for Best Debut, followed by Into the Night in 2018 and Where the Dead Go in 2019. And her latest book is The Housemate, which hopefully it will let me share, or maybe not share the copy. Um, so and yeah and i've recently read that and really enjoyed reading it thanks sarah and Thank also just want to mention as well if you're watching live and you post a question during the facebook live for sarah um you'll have a chance to win a copy of the housemate thanks to alan and unwin so thanks so much sarah for joining us just wondering if you want to start off by telling us a little bit about the housemate Sure. Um, so The Housemate is my first standalone novel um, after writing a, a trilogy. So it introduces a journalist character called Ollie Groves and essentially it's a, it's a cold case story that she worked on 10 years ago that suddenly hots up. So at the start of the book we meet her when she's a junior reporter uh, and then we sort of flash forward 10 years and elements of the story that she worked on then have sort of reappeared on the front pages and she's sort of thrust back into that same story again and it kind of goes from there and we've got quite a few people watching already so i've got some questions coming through for you um mary okay. wonders who inspires your writing uh sort of i think it comes from all different places to be honest i kind of tend to um pick and pick and pack a whole lot of different ideas from um, sometimes it's news headlines and then sometimes it's just random sort of thoughts and they tend to start as just little premises and then if, if I, I guess if I think it's a good enough idea, it tends to sort of turn around in my head and I add little bits and pieces onto it and then I think it's the characters that really start to bring it to life. So once I've got my head around a character that I think is going to work in that uh, scenario, that's when I think it starts to sort of form into mm -hmm. a proper narrative story. Yeah, yeah. And I've had um, a few people who have said that they've read your other books, your trilogies, and really looking forward to reading The Housemate. Um, just oh, wondering you. if you can tell us a little bit about your trilogy as well. Of course, yeah. So the, the trilogy started with The Dark Lake, um, and it's set in a regional, um, fictional New South Wales town. And Detective Gemma Woodstock, who's quite a young, um, feisty detective in that town, she's um, thrown into a really difficult uh, murder case where the local high school teacher has been found dead in the lake. Uh, and she used to go to high school with the teacher. So straight away, there's kind of all of this past history that she revisits and um, lots of secrets, a bit of a small town kind of simmering uh, to boiling point, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and then as the trilogy goes on, um, we sort of follow Gemma through um, a move to the city. She moves to Melbourne and there's another big case that she works on. And then the final book, uh, well, so far, the third book, um, is in like a beachside town with another um, crime where a girl's gone missing and her, her teenage boyfriend dies. So there's always mm -hmm. kind of like a big... Um, murder mystery to be solved but in those books Gemma's personal life's also kind of a bit of a mystery as well yeah yeah and um Jill's wondering if you've got another novel in the pipeline uh well I've, I've actually just finished an audio book that's just been published um by Amazon so that's live now and I've been working on that actually for a really long time it was the first book I started trying to write and then put it on ice for a couple of years so I finally yeah. finished finished that um, that's called Final Act. So that's uh, interesting you say an audio book. So is it just an audio book? Yeah, at the moment it's just an okay, audio book. that's so, interesting, um, yeah. We'll, we'll see. But mm. yeah, it's a bit shorter. So mm. I think it's like a kind of like a novella, I suppose, technically. Mm. Um, and then at the moment I'm actually working on um, the treatment for The Dark Lake. Um, Hopscotch Features bought the film rights a couple of years oh, ago okay. and I'm working... Yeah, working That's with them exciting. at the moment to um, 
map out like an mm. episodic series. So mm. we'll see if um, it will see if something happens with that. It's always a bit of potluck, I think. Mm. Mm. And will we see more in the um, Gemma series? I hope so. I have an idea for a fourth book. I just haven't quite gotten around to um, writing it all down yet, but. Yeah, I'd like to think so. It feels like there's just still something more in that character for me. Yeah. So um, that's definitely something I'd like to do, but I've got quite a lot of ideas. So I, <laughs> I, I sort of have to like focus on one and, and really buckle down and write it. So yeah, ho yeah. hopefully is the answer. <laughs> yeah. And how do you do that? Like when you're writing something, how do you stop all these other ideas, keep tapping you on your, your shoulder and say, <laughs> don't forget about oh, me or... <laughs> It's hard, actually. I find it really distracting. Um, mm. I think once I get to a point where I've got a decent amount of words down, though, it sort of, it kind of forces me to focus because I, I think you, you reach like a critical mass point and you, you just sort of figure that you've invested all this time in that idea, you've kind of got to see it through. Mm. Um, but when I'm in like the non writing phase i definitely find it difficult to stop being tempted by all of the ideas and they all seem better than each other <laughs> um and then i just have to kind of buckle down and and really focus so yeah i can, I, I think i hear a lot of people say they struggle coming up with ideas but that's not my problem my problem is sort of um actually getting the discipline to sit down and write the book that's my tricky part <laughs> yeah yeah and speaking about that um probably wendy's questions a lot to do with that she says you must be very busy having a business and writing how do you find the time yeah it is busy some weeks are really tricky just depending on what's going on at work um i i, I guess i just kind of try to prioritize what i can and i i Feel, feel like I get into a mode sometimes where I'm like, right, I just stop wasting time and I kind of use all of the spare hours that I have. Um, and then when I'm procrastinating, it's terrible. Like I mm -hmm. just sort of sit there for ages, but I don't really get a lot done. So I think a lot of it is mindset and just mm -hmm. uh, using whatever scraps of time I, I, I can find. Um, and then I'll try to occasionally block out, you know, decent chunks of time on like a Saturday or a Sunday um, or evenings during the week and, and just try to get done as much as I can. But, um, yeah, it can be a bit of a juggle, mm. but I, I think I really like writing. So I, I just try to prioritise it when I feel passionate about an idea, I guess. Yeah, yeah. And um, Belinda wonders if you, who has been your favourite character to write? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think oh, it's, it's different for different reasons. Like I think Gemma the character in my um, trilogy will always be special to me just because I guess she was, she's been a vehicle through three of my books and I've kind of put her through the ringer and um, watched her really develop as a, as a person. Mm -hmm. um, so she will always be, I think, pretty special to me. Um, but I really like her boss in the um, Dark Lake series as well. I think he's a really, he's a really sort of interesting father figure kind of character to her. So he's quite special. Um, and in The Housemate, the latest book, um, I think Cooper, who Ollie's buddied up with um, to do the podcast with, is kind of a really fun character. He was a very fun character to write. So, yeah, I think all characters are important because you sort of, mm. you need that world to feel real and you need all the characters to sort of work. Mm. Um, but there's, yeah, there's definitely a couple that stand out um, for me. Mm. Mm. And Sarah Joy wonders what you like to read yourself and um, wondering if there's anything you might have read lately that you could recommend to us. Yeah, I love, I mean, I love um, reading all different kinds of books. So I, I mean, I do really like reading crime thrillers and I always have really enjoyed crime thrillers. So um, I'm reading Chris Hammer's book at the moment, his latest book, because I'm um, interviewing him in about a month's time. So Treasure and Dirt is um, his standalone novel that I'm reading. Um, mm. And I did read Station Eleven last year in peak pandemic, which is sort of about a pandemic itself, um, which I loved. That's a, it's a, an amazing novel. So I definitely recommend Station Eleven. Um, th there's lots of books I've kind of read lately that I um, would recommend. Anna Downs's new book, The Shadow House, oh, was yes. another great... I've just started um, reading, reading, reading yeah, that one. Yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah. Really like eerie and atmospheric. Mm. I think she's, you know, does a really good job of that um, suspense all the way through that book. And 
Yeah, lot, lots of novels, and I'm really lucky I get sent a lot of books to yeah. read. Um, my friend Afa Clifford's just about to send me her new book to, to read. Um, so, yeah, I'm never sort of short of, of all these talented people I know who write books that I get mm. <laughs> lucky enough to get previews yeah. for. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I do like crime novels. I think um, there's something just really fun and escapist about diving into a, a world and having, like, a, a puzzle to solve and... I think here in Australia, there's, you know, it, it, there's some really amazing stories coming out all the time. So we're very lucky. Yeah, that's very true. And what about research for your books? Do you, what sort of research do you do? And are you reading a lot for research as well? Yeah, it's, it's pretty mixed. I don't tend to do a lot of research at the start. I kind of really want to get my head around what I want the story to be, the characters, the mm. world. And I kind of try to write quite a bit down before I get too stuck up in the details because I find that I'm better when I write quite fast um, and so anything that slows me down tends to really ruin my ability to get words down mm. so I might just check a couple of um, really important sort of key facts before I get too sort of far into the actual story um, but once I've got the bones of the book down or the structure sort of working in my head that's when I'll then go back and do lots of fact checking, you know, just lots of online research to make sure that what I'm saying is plausible and makes sense. Um, and then I also will try to find some experts in the field that let me either ask them questions or tag along to um, a bit of a day in the life of. Yeah. Um, for the housemate, I for the housemate I went to um, court a couple of times and just watched um, proceedings, sort of particularly okay. rulings being made. Yeah, mm. things like that. Mm. And then it's quite you know, um, interesting after the court cases that are standing outside and just watching how the different parties interact. And I think mm -hmm. you can pick up quite a lot just being around those environments mm -hmm. rather than necessarily having to always ask lots of questions. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's sort of, it's a bit of everything really, but I definitely do it the reverse way from a lot of other writers in that I don't do it up front. I tend to do it kind of as, I, as I'm going along. Yeah, okay, that's interesting, yeah. And what about um, writing? Is that something that you thought you'd get into? What was your, did you do study mm -hmm. after you left school or? I, yeah, it's funny. It's hard to sort of um, know exactly. When I look back, I sort of feel like I've always wanted to write books, but I'm not, I think that's true to some extent, but I don't think I was ever particularly serious about it. Yeah. I really liked um, creative writing in school and, you know, was often, I'd always choose to do the creative writing projects in English and things like that. Mm. And I did study literature. Uh, and then after school, I was interested in um, definitely in sort of PR, marketing, but also journalism. Mm. Um, so I think journalism was what I particularly wanted to kind of work toward a career in. And then I just sort of I did do a little bit of journalist um, work experience at Channel 10 and the Herald Sun in Melbourne and enjoyed that, but just ended up tumbling into a marketing advertising job and just loved it. So mm -hmm. kind of got stuck in a really great way for a long time. Um, and then it wasn't until um, I was a bit older that I just kind of wouldn't stop, couldn't stop thinking about the idea of writing a book, I think. And mm -hmm. the more I kept thinking about it, the more I wanted to do it, but the harder it felt. And then I sort of just ended up um, making a bit of an agreement with myself that I would give it a shot and I gave myself a deadline and um, yeah. And then, and then it kind of kept, kept happening. So yeah. it's been a nice, nice thing to, to really push for a bit later on. Yeah. And how hard or easy was it to get that first book published? Uh, it was, it was hard to write. I felt like yeah. I did work really hard you know hours and hours and hours a week that I sort of would put aside and mm. it was difficult to write the story mm. um I was very lucky I think I got an agent um quite quickly I think I just sent her an email at the right moment in time with the right pitch and she liked the book so that was actually a really sort of straightforward process for me um and then a lot of more hard work happened because she had feedback on the uh, manuscript and yeah. so I had to do lots of editing mm. and then once we got a publisher I did lots of editing again mm. <laughs> so it was both kind of hard and easy for me I think I was very lucky um, in finding someone that helped me navigate the industry really quickly mm. but the work part of it was challenging and I definitely had a few moments where I was pretty close to giving up but um 
I think once you know someone's interested in your book, you, you know, you sort of feel compelled to finish because you, you sort of feel like you've come so far, you may as well yeah. go all, all the way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And Kelly's got a good question. She says she's a huge fan of yours um, and wonders what book left the greatest impression on you after you finished it? Uh, in terms of writing it? Yeah. Uh, look, I mean, I think nothing will ever compare to the first book just because I mm. couldn't believe that it was published and mm. it felt pretty surreal. Like the whole thing just felt bizarre. Um, but I think the the third book in the series was actually my most difficult book ever to write. I just kind of had a bit of a false start with it. I wrote a draft and then ended up sort of rewriting the whole thing and had pretty challenging feedback from my publishers. So that one felt like the biggest achievement just because by the time I actually finished it, it sort of felt like I'd written it three yeah. times. Yeah. Um, and so I definitely had a funny relationship with that book for a while because I'd see mm. it and just think, oh, my God, I never want to look at that book again. Mm. Um, but now I think it's probably become one of my favourite sort of stories. So maybe maybe it was the maybe it was the journey that that book needed to go on. I don't know. Mm. Um, but, yeah, they're all, I mean, they're all kind of important, I suppose, in their own way just because you put so much time and effort into them. Mm. Um, but I think the first one will always have a pretty special place in my in my mind. Mm-hmm. And Belinda and Kelly have similar questions. Um, they want Belinda wonders um, when you start writing, do you know how the story's going to end? And Kelly said, do you mm-hmm. plan before your start where the twists are going to come as you write? write? So I think the answer to both of those questions is sort of no. Like I'm not a very good planner. Mm. I tend to have a premise in mind that I really like um sort of what I was saying before once I've got an idea in my head that won't leave me alone that tends to be when I sort of feel like maybe there's a book in that concept so the premise kind of is always there and I sort of understand what the the question of the book's going to be or what the key theme is Mm -hmm. and then I do kind of map out a few key beats of the book in my head and I and I typically know what I want the story to sort of end like but in terms of all of the details in between and all of the characters and all the sort of moments, I suppose, they kind of come as I'm writing. Um, and I find the more I write, the, the better they, they kind of come. So it's sort of like a bit of a self-fulfilling momentum, I, I guess, once I start writing, it kind of it gets better and better. Um, so I do sort of... I do sort of know some parts of it, but I definitely can surprise myself as I'm going mm. along. Mm. And the, the twists are sort of, I think it's really hard to plan twists. Um, I think you can plan like one big twist, uh, you know, before you start writing, almost like the uh, the twist, I guess you'd call it, like the thing that everyone's mm. like, oh my gosh, that's the whole kind of concept mm. of the book. But because mm. my books aren't really, they've got twists in them, but they're not high concept twist where suddenly everything that you thought is kind of yeah, pulled out from under I, yeah. wish, I wish I could <laughs> do that <laughs> but I, that's not sort of so far what I've been able to um, pull off so I think mine are a little bit more narrative twists and they can come as I'm writing or sometimes I can actually sort of figure them out as I'm editing and, and you sort of can start to see the the pattern of the book a bit better and have some perspective so yeah some of them are actually quite clinically inserted which sounds not very um fun but um others are more sort of things that i kind of know i want to try to include so it's just a bit of a mix but yeah yeah, i'm a terrible planner so um (laughs) i definitely don't write it all down and Mm. have it all organized in my Mm. head i I sort of tend to chaotically pull it together as i go Mm. and jill wonders how much attention you pay to your reviews oh um I think the answer is that I used to probably pay a lot more attention to them. Yeah. Um, and it wasn't, not that I was ever too affected by them. Like I I definitely know people that get really upset about reviews and I don't um, get upset. I kind of, sometimes they're really interesting. Like I think there's often things that I kind of go, actually, that's a really good point, <laughs> mm. um, even if they're negative. Um, mm. And it's nice just to hear different people's perspectives on, on something that you've written because it, it's really um, hard, I think, to have perspective on your own book in, in a way. Um, so I quite enjoy reviews. Like I sort of, I, 
I've got, I think, quite a good relationship with them. And I think it's really nice that people take the time to leave feedback. And um, yeah, every now and again, I might read one and think, oh, okay, that's definitely someone that didn't like the book, but, um, but that's okay. Like, I think that's, you know, there's books I like more than others and, yeah. and that's fine. So, mm. and some of them are funny. I mean, um, yeah, there's definitely a couple of re um, reviews about the Dark Lake that make me laugh because they're very, they're mean, but they're kind of mean in like a very dis <coughs> dismissive me. way. So, yeah, I, I, I don't mind. I think um, all reviews are, are welcome, really. Yeah, yeah. And MJ's <laughs> got a very interesting question. She says, in the house, mate, you um, chose a journalist and a podcaster to join forces. What well, seems like a clash between traditional news versus emerging avenues for reporting news. So she'd like yes. to know a little bit more yeah. about that. Well, I really, I, I mean, I set the book in 2015 sort of for that reason, because it was right at that point in time where those two worlds were colliding mm. people weren't really sure what was going to happen with the whole podcast channel it was doing well but it wasn't nearly you know as popular as it is now mm. and i think there was a lot of journalists back then that were pretty skeptical and pretty worried about how fragmented the media world had already become and how much more fragmented it was sort of about to become yeah and i just really liked the idea of Ollie being, you know, quite traditional and quite um, proper and finding the whole thing really frustrating and then having this kind of optimistic, tech-savvy, upbeat, young millennial telling her that, you know, this was the future of journalism. And I think even though that's not what the story is about, you know, fundamentally, I think their dynamic and that kind of layer on top of the actual cold case that they're researching did add, like, a good tension around media um and what, what what is good media like that whole question i think is really interesting yeah. um but also just their relationship which you know i think because i had to spend so much time together it gave them something to really riff off so um yeah i think you know lots of industries have that tension and i i think it's a really interesting dynamic to um to explore yeah and Wendy wonders if you ever see the character or the, the characters seem to tell you where they need to go. Yes, I think so. I mean, not in like a super spiritual kind of way where I sit at my desk and they, you know, talk to me or anything like that, mm -hmm. but more in a, um, as I'm writing, I think you start to get a real feel for what the characters would say next. How, just what how they, they react to certain situations and to each other um and it's sort of for me it feels like when you're talking to someone that you're comfortable with or that you you know know well and you kind of banter off each other or you've sort of got mm. that rhythm going mm. i think when i get to that point with my characters i guess i feel like i know them well enough that i sort of you can start to predict their reaction and their feelings and their dynamic in a certain situation. So yeah, it becomes quite um, familiar, I guess, is the best way to describe it. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, they don't they don't kind of talk to me particularly or lead the way, but it is like a, a familiarity that yeah. is really nice. I think once you get into that kind of flow, I feel like you're in a good spot with your characters. Mm -hmm. And could you tell us when you're writing a series, how do you keep things fresh for both your readers and yourself? <laughs> um, I, don't, I think it's hard like I definitely have times where because especially when I'm editing my own book it's really hard to have that first perspective because I've read it many yeah. many times and I know what happens and mm -hmm. you know I've rewritten bits of it so I'm already sick of it and one of my biggest kind of fears always is, you know, oh God, how boring is this book? Because I can't tell. Yeah. Um, and so I'm always saying that to my my agent and my publisher who tend to be my first readers. I'm like, is it boring or is it still interesting? And mm. <laughs> it's, it is difficult. Um, I think, I don't know what the answer really is. I think you just, I, I guess I just try to make sure that each character sort of got its own agenda and um, little quirks and things that make them, feel as real to me as possible mm -hmm. and then once they've got the, all those little pieces of them that I can play with I guess I hope that that keeps the story moving along as well as the characters kind of moving along so yeah, yeah it's not a very scientific process I think it's pretty intuitive but um 
yeah, I am conscious of it. I think, you know, you do worry that it sort of isn't, isn't interesting or whatever, but um, yeah, I guess you just, you kind of just have to push it along and, and hope for the best a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And what do you find the most difficult part of your writing process? It's, it's really difficult to get feedback and then to work out how to address that feedback. Yeah. Um, I mean, even when you know that the feedback is really good and really important, it's still that moment of sort of reading all the feedback and sort of sitting there thinking, oh, like, how am I going to fix this? Because it does feel, even once you've got a draft, even if you know that draft's not perfect, mm. the thought of like untangling it and rewriting bits of it and like moving everything around is pretty daunting. Um, and it does feel a bit like a Jenga tower where you kind of worry that if you pull one thing out, the whole well, thing's going to yeah. tumble down and you can't <laughs> fix it. So mm. I still find getting feedback really challenging. I kind of half like close my eyes while I'm opening the file and, you know, praying <laughs> mm. for the best. But um, yeah, I think all bits of it are difficult in different ways. Like getting that first draft down can be pretty like relentless and it can feel like a bit of a slog. Mm. Um, and then editing is tedious it's sort of a, it's like a, it's a bit more frustrating than it is stressful I suppose when you've got to kind of go back and reread things and pay attention and really kind of think about it and you know just different parts of the process are different um, and challenging in different mm. ways but um I think it's worth like for me it's worth it and I suppose that's why I keep doing it it's hard but it's definitely I definitely like the feeling at the end <laughs> so yeah. that kind of keeps me keeps me going yeah yeah <laughs> And um, Sarah Joy wonders how lockdown has affected your writing. And um, I thought you're in Melbourne, as we said before, so we're happy to hear that you're coming out of lockdown on Thursday, yeah. I think I heard. Very exciting. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think it's it's been different at different stages, I guess. And, mm. um, yeah, last year was obviously super unexpected, a little bit novelty, I suppose, at the start. And, uh, you know, everyone was working from home. So suddenly everyone from my work was at home and we were trying to work mm -hmm. out how to make the business work. And mm -hmm. that was stressful, but also, I guess, quite interesting and lots of adrenaline and all of that sort of thing. And then homeschooling part, you know, very tedious. And then, and then I think it just settled into a really dull relentlessness. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but last year it was helpful for me in, in the sense that I had a deadline and I was forced to be at home a lot. So I did just really bunker down and, and write a mm. lot during um, evenings, during the week mm. uh, and on weekends as well. So I probably found that helpful in some ways. Um, but at the same time, like I really don't like writing at home. I, I really prefer to be out writing in cafes or um, bars or libraries oh, or just anywhere yeah. but home really. Mm. So I definitely had to adjust to that. Uh, environment being really similar and I found that pretty um, difficult at the start and then this year I've been writing a little bit less I've just been editing like finishing the housemate off and then um, finishing the audio book so mm -hmm. not so much drafting more just editing and finalizing which I think has been kind of fine in lockdown that's been sort of something to focus on and do um, but yeah now that we're almost out I'm kind of hoping that maybe once we get out it all sort of prompt all these new ideas yeah. once I'm not staring at the same wall yeah. all the time so yeah we'll see <laughs> and you'll be able to hear everyone else's conversations and yeah exactly it's some... inspiring being around yeah. people I think so yeah yeah and Belinda wonders if you do anything to celebrate the release of each new book oh just um I mean this year was really strange because I mean I haven't even really seen the book in a in a bookshop yet mm. so that's been quite different and normally there'd be all of these um, book events that I do, which would be really nice because I'd get to see lots of people I know and um, I guess, you know, be in bookstores with booksellers, which yeah. is such a lovely part of the whole thing. Mm. So this year has been a bit kind of um, lots of video screens and talking to people, which is still really nice, but just a bit different. Um, but, yeah, I tend to just sort of normally celebrate by having, you know, go out for a nice dinner with friends or whatever, nothing sort of too... Um, no, nothing too symbolic. Although, um, you know, I do think at some point I should I should do something that's really kind of relevant to the book. But um, yeah, it's just nice kind of being able to celebrate with people, I guess, that um, 
have been supportive while I've been writing. Yeah. Um, that's kind of the thing for me. Yeah. yeah. And have you got anyone you can share with us that has been really supportive with your writing? Uh, I mean, lots of people along the way. I think before um, I wrote The Dark Lake, my first book, there was lots of people um, who I was working with at the time that were really supportive, mm. who read early drafts. And I found that really important back then. Like, I think I've gotten a lot better now at not sharing my work kind of constantly because I, mm. I sort of am the opposite now where I like to wait till it's all sort of finished. Mm. But back then, I think it was really important to... Um, prove that I was making progress and there was, it was nice to be able to share with people and get their feedback. So there yeah. was some really nice sort of work colleagues that, that were very generous with their time. And my sister, you know, has always been really good at reading early drafts and my parents have been really supportive as well. So, yeah, I think there's people that have always been sort of willing to um, humour me mm -hmm. <laughs> um, even before there were books um, ar around to actually sort of take seriously. And my agent is, um, you know, she's great. Um, Lynn's always really helpful. I'm happy to chat to me about ideas and read my early drafts and things like that too. So, yeah, it's it's nice to kind of have people that you can um, talk to. And then lots of friends that I just tend to talk about ideas with. Not so much show them the actual um, manuscripts, but just play around with concepts and get, you know, their point of view, which I find really, that's really, really helpful for me. Yeah. Um, and luckily they seem quite you know, interested in talking about books and ideas. So, um, yeah, that's that's always, yeah, really important part of the process as well, I think. Yeah, yeah. And Kelly wonders what your favourite part of your writer's journey has been so far. Uh, I mean, lots of, I think lots of parts of it have been pretty special. Um, I've definitely met a lot of really good friends as part of the process, which is, you know, really lovely. So lots of um, other authors that I now, you know, see all the time and speak to and um, write emails back and forth yeah. and um, get to hang out with and things. So that's been, I think, probably the best part about the whole thing. Um, but there's definitely been um, a couple of, like, phone calls, I suppose, that I remember being, you know, just those really, like, iconic moments. So, you know, my mm. agent calling me to say that Alan and I'm only going to publish the book was pretty... Mm crazy and I was in a work um on the way to a work meeting in the car with a colleague and you know it's just so exciting yeah. and he was really excited so there's like definitely a couple of key sort of phone calls that are really they feel sort of like movie <laughs> movie moments mm. um so yeah I mean I'll never forget those moments like they they definitely just felt like surreal someone else's storyline happening to me kind of thing um and then there's just been crazy sort of moments like I interviewed um Linda LaPlante at a book event oh, and yes. she is yeah. a whirlwind of a person mm. and you know there was how many hundred people there and yeah just you know really um strange but like special moments like that too that writing has kind of led me to so mm. yeah I feel really lucky it's been a, a mixed bag but almost all of all of that bag's been good so yeah. it's been nice yeah and MJ wonders if you prefer to read a book or to listen to one. Uh, um, I think it depends a little bit. Like I prefer reading, I'd say, overall. Like I do mm. really like holding a book and, you know, nothing is better for me from a, like, relaxing point of view than the thought of being on a beach with a book or in a bath with a book or poolside with a book. Like there's something about that that just is such a nice way to spend time. Yeah. Um, but I do find that if I'm busy and I'm, you know, um, commuting or walking kids sort of to school and then me walking back home or whatever, it, an audio book is great because it's such a great way to consume a story and not have to um, have specific time carved out to do it. So um, I normally will have a written book and an audio book on the go at the same time. And I find I can flip between the two really easily because it's as if the, the two storylines don't get confused yeah. in my head because they're in different channels. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm listening to Rock, Scissors, Paper or Paper, Scissors, Rock. I'm not sure what the order is at the moment, um, which is a which is a thriller. And it's, yeah, the, the voice is really distinctive. And, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I find that really fun if I'm cooking or I'm walking or whatever. Yeah. Um, and then I've got you know, my, my proper book as well. So I think both have just got different purposes, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
And MJ's got a good question. Um, she wonders if there's a celebrity that you would love to narrate your books. Oh, um, I don't know. I, I haven't really thought about that. Um, I mean, I do love um, Felicity um, Jerd um, narrated The Housemate, and I think she's got an amazing voice. And I've had a lot of people actually contact me to say how much they love listening to her voice. Um, so she's she's been pretty perfect. So I wouldn't yeah. want to replace her. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. I haven't really thought about the... Um, a narrator for an audiobook mm. question. I'm sure there is. I just haven't got a good <laughs> answer right now because yeah. I haven't thought about it. But um, I do. I do know that there's a bit of a trend now to have celebrities reading mm. stories, and mm. I, I can see how that would definitely make the experience sort of more interesting. I guess so. Mm. Um, I'll, I'll have a think about that, and I'll come up yeah. with a better answer. <laughs> That's good. Thanks. Well, thanks so much for talking to us. It's been great chatting to you. Just wondering if you You're want welcome. to tell people watching um, how they can keep in touch with you. Uh, yes. So, I mean, I'm on um, Instagram and I'm on Twitter. Um, I do have a Facebook page as well, which is Sarah Bailey Author. Um, but yeah, on Instagram is probably where I am most of the time and it's Sarah Bailey Author. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'd, I'd love to hear feedback from people about books and what they're reading and what they think of my books too so yeah thank you very much yeah. for, for listening yeah well thanks for joining us and thanks to everyone who joined in we had some really great questions thanks thank you thanks bye everybody